wanted to, uh, just again to wanted again to uh, express my thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, and you know, this is um, perhaps, hopefully, the last of our uh, step zero nights. So uh, on to uh, maybe uh, better times. Um, I wanted to uh, sort of just give you an overview of some research that I've been involved in for the last several years. And uh, it's sort of uh, um, broadly about the topic of shifting distributions of the links in Bobcat. I wanted to um, set the stage. Hang on a second. I think it's, there we go. Okay, so I want to set the stage for this presentation with this painting, which some of you may know is by J.E.H. McDonald. It's a group of seven painting. Um, it's called Algoma Waterfall. And this was painted right at the end of the last pandemic, uh, the Spanish flu um, pandemic in 1918. This was painted in 1919. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, an appropriate place to start the presentation because a lot of the, it's kind of the landscape where a lot of the action takes place in the, in the, the uh, material that I'm gonna present to you. And so this is a Northern, kind of an iconic Northern image and Northern landscape, which is relevant to the presentation. Likewise, here's a painting of a candle links by Audubon. And this is, uh, this is another one of our the players uh, that's gonna be on the stage of Algoma. This is uh, an animal that is familiar to everyone. I want you to notice the large paws, especially. This is a Northern icon, I think we could probably all agree. It's, this is an animal that is um, you know, well known and, and kind of culturally uh, identified as a Northern animal. It's a sort of secretive forest animal in the, from the northern coniferous forest. The other player is this bobcat, which is again here painted by Audubon. And this is more of a southern animal, smaller feet, uh, and perhaps less familiar to us in Ontario. Across the world, there are four lynx species. So, four species in, in the genus lynx. There is uh, the candle lynx here in purple. And then down here in the green is the bobcat. That's the range of the bobcat. Both of these two species occur only in North America. Uh, this orange is the European lynx, lynx lynx it's called. And then there's a couple of very small little red dots here, which are uh, you know, the, the isolated range of the Iberian lynx, which is the most endangered of the lynx species. Just uh, a taxonomic tree to show you where they fit. These are the four lynx species. They have a common ancestor with, these are the house cat and European wild cat and the cougar. And these are like the fishing cat and some of those species and they share a common ancestor with lynx back fairly far in the, in the tree. The, the, the candle lynx on the left here has quite a leggy sort of like uh, build. It's, it's quite lean, it has long legs. It has particularly long hind legs, well adapted for walking in deep snow, has large feet, has these pointy ears. And the tail, another distinguishing feature is the tail has a kind of black on the top and white on the bottom. Whereas a bobcat has a completely black tail tip, the, the ears are not quite as pointed and the body is just heavier. It's kind of a heavier animal. Uh, sort of stockier, thicker legs, thicker torso. Notably, there's quite a marked difference in foot size between these two species. And that is something that uh, we'll uh, return to through the presentation because it's an important feature in the ecology of both species in this part of the world. Lynx are well characterized and very well known as a species that cycles with the snowshoe hare. So it, it is in this 10, sort of eight to 11 year, on average 10 year cycle with snowshoe hares. And that's because uh, in part, it's an obligate predator of snowshoe hares. And so they're in this, um, this kind of density dependent relationship that's, that's reinforced by the specialized nature of the lynx 
And so their lynx lags behind because of the time it takes to reproduce and the, the increases, the, numer the numerical increase in lynx is caused by increased reproduction. So as hair populations go up, it takes a bit of time for lynx to respond reproductively. And so they lag behind by one to two years, but they're pretty closely in phase in most of the range of the lynx with, with cycling hairs. Across Canada, you can see that playing out in harvest data. So these are, these are harvest data, which happened to start. So this is when Statistics Canada began to collect data on fur harvest across Canada. This was 1919. So this is the same year that McDonald painted the Algoma waterfall, the start of this time series. And you can see the peaks and valleys that are caused by the cycle of the hares. I'll draw your attention uh, to the three peaks that occurred in right on 1960, 1970, 1980 in British Columbia. These are extremely high amplitude peaks and links that happened at that time. And this is another thing that I'll, I'll, I'll come back to in the, in the presentation. These are sometimes referred to by lynx ecologists as super peaks that for some reason that we don't fully understand, there were very high peaks at that time. So the amplitude of the cycle was very high. And that can be seen right across um, most of the country. Alberta, there are the, there's the, the cycle in Alberta, the, the hair, I'm sorry, the lynx harvest trends, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland and Labrador, Northwest Territories, Yukon. So uh, we have a pretty good understanding of the dynamics historically, all the way back to uh, times when the, the fur harvest was, um, uh, you know, uh, an activity of uh, early European settlers and those numbers were tracked in Hudson Bay uh, company trading posts. We can go all the way back into those days with uh, tracking hair, uh, uh, sorry, lynx cycles. And so we have a good understanding of the long-term dynamics of hairs, of, of lynx and hairs across the the continent, but otherwise it's quite a difficult species to survey the lynx because it's quite cryptic, it's wide, it sort of travels a long way, it's, it's, it's low density typically. And so we do tend to use harvest data uh, quite a lot in, in kind of monitoring lynx populations to try and understand what's happening with their trends. This is the mean harvest of lynx uh, in Ontario between 1980 and 2010. So the dark colors are where there were more lynx. So in the south, the very far south, there are really almost no lynx uh, harvested in, during that time. The far north, there really are no lynx being harvested. So they're in the boreal forest in, you know, within the coniferous forest tree line. And uh, their kind of peak abundance is right in that area, um, kind of in that sort of mid latitudes area in Ontario. We have tried to quantify the change in the distribution of lynx through the harvest data. And so this figure that I'm showing you shows four time series. There's, this is the harvest of lynx in Ontario from 1972 to 1981 in this A panel in the top left. In the B panel, it's 1982 to 1991. And the line that we show here is our estimate based on a certain systematic way to quantify the Southern Range Edge. This was our estimate in 19, for that first time series. And then for 82 to 91, it moved north a bit. For 1992 to 2001, it moved north even more. And then you can see all four range boundaries kind of uh, contracting from the 70s up to 2010. And we estimate that over that time, using this systematic way of measuring, a sort of objective way of measuring the range edge, we estimate that in that part of the range of links, there was a range contraction northwards at the southern edge of the Lynx range of 175 kilometers. So as we look through these four decades, we saw that in the 70s, links were a lot farther south than they are today, essentially. There were lots of links around Timon, I'm sorry, Tweed and, and some places like that, Mazinaw. Uh, and today they're essentially absent from that area. But this is a confusing looking slide, but really what we did here was we took this analysis in a new paper that's just come out this year and we 
We took it even farther. We went back all the way to 1948, which involved digitizing uh, trap line data that used to be only available on paper copies. And I suspect that Ed Addison is out there listening to this. And I know that he copied those records and put them in a box. And I actually digitized the box. So, so these are records that came from, from digitizing all the old harvest data. And uh, what's, uh, what's interesting when you go back in time farther and you, you can see on this figure, each year is shown and the red is when there's a low probability of a lynx being harvested. And this is just the very Southern edge of the range that we're looking at. So we're not in the core part of the range here. Uh, the, the red shows there's very low links in sort of the southern part of the range. And the green is when there's high links. So through the 70s, when, you know, that time when we saw a lot of links uh, in that previous slide, there was green down in the south. But then as you get up into the 80s, there's a contraction and it's red and it's red. And then as you go back down, it becomes green again. So what this is saying is that to simplify this, it shows you that the southern range edge of the lynx is quite dynamic. And what really drives the, the, the southern range occupancy is where it is in the lynx cycle. So when the lynx cycle the, in the core part of the range. So when there's a lot of lynx in the core part of the range, they disperse south and that extends the range southwards. And so what we see is that it really is context dependent to try and understand where the southern edge of the lynx range is. The net effect though, is that it's moving northwards, but, and the, but uh, that's mostly because the amplitude of the cycle is going, is, is low. I showed you those super peaks in the seventies and eighties. Uh, we don't see those. We haven't seen a super peak since 1980. And so the amplitude is not as high. So links are not dispersing south as far. And that's the dynamic that limits occupancy of the south by links. We don't know at this point why we don't see those high peaks that we used to see. One of the things that might be driving that, it's hard, these are complicated relationships. There's involving a lot of trophic dynamics and you know, ecosystem level uh, changes, but we do see that there's a reduction in snow depth. So with this area here, the MNRF has a snow network where we, we measure snow depth all through the winter and for those years, you can see that there is a kind of decline. It's quite variable, but there is a long-term decline in snow depth, for example, at these stations, which are along the North Shore of Lake Huron, in the same place that I'm going to talk about some of the steel work. So just to remind you about foot size, you know, snow depth might be, if snow depth is going down, that might set the conditions for bobcat to play a, a greater role in the ecosystem up there because they are no longer limited by, by deep snow. And that might lead to more interaction with lynx, which could lead to competition. Um, anecdotally, you know, there are sightings increasing uh, in Southern Ontario by people who haven't seen bobcats around before. and suddenly are seeing them. So that anecdotal type of information also suggests that bobcats are increasing at the same time as we're seeing these changes in the lynx range. So all of that le led to the research project, um, and there's actually a few different connected projects, but the general project that I'm gonna tell you about had this sort of overarching question of, you know, are lynx distributions shifting due to bobcats? or are they shifting due to changing snow and habitat conditions? This is the question that I'm setting up here to, to try and answer through this presentation. I want to especially draw your attention to the two people in this slide. This is Dr. Robbie Marat and Samantha Moran. And uh, Robbie and, and Sam were graduate students at Trent uh, who were instrumental in doing this work. Much of the field work that I'm gonna talk about the, the work on the North Shore constituted uh, portions of their thesis projects at Trent University. So uh, just uh, gonna show you a few pictures here, essentially of some of the work that we were doing up there. Uh, we, we tried to look at the distributions of lynx and bobcat on the North Shore uh, because we had a feeling that the North Shore was a, a, a good place to do this work because there are records of bobcats there and it seemed like the most likely place where we would see interactions that we wanted to see. 
We did some snow tracking to try and estimate the relative distributions of these uh, species. We did a lot of that snow tracking by driving transects with snow machines. So we would drive eight to 10 kilometer transects, which has uh, been shown in other studies to be a good length of transect to have a high probability of detecting those two cat species. And so by putting these transects randomly through, through um, I guess it's stratified random is how we did it. And we, we looked through the sort of different forest types across the North shore. And we were essentially counting tracks and, tra and seeing where the two species occurred. They're very different um, from the perspective of identifying the tracks. So Lynx has a big foot, so it leaves a very distinctive large track. The bobcat has a small foot. And so it's quite easy to tell bobcat from a, a lynx. That is a bobcat track. One of the real, even apart from the size, one of the real um, clear signs is that bobcats don't have any fur on the pads on the bottom of their feet. They have like a, a naked pad, whereas a lynx has a heavily furred pad. And I, I think you would have seen that in the picture that I showed a moment ago of the feet. We took detailed snow measurements because we were interested in the effect of snow on the relative abundance of these two species and on their distributions. Uh, we used a bunch of other forest uh, information as well. We also did some camera surveys. So there's a, a, a lynx caught on one of our trail cameras. We use that to help supplement our information and also to guide us in some trapping work that we were doing. So we wanted to, there's a scent marking uh, animal. We wanted to catch some animals so we could put GPS trans transmitters on them in order to try and uh, see how they interacted with one another in cases where they were sympatric, where they were overlapping. So there's Robbie building a trap. So we, we trapped uh, these cats using a few different methods. We, it was all box traps, but sometimes we used these homemade traps that were made with just wood and chicken wire. And that's what Robbie's putting together there. And we also used, um, so there's a completed trap and it just has a sliding door that is got a, there's a bait at the back and if the lynx goes in there and pulls on the bait, it drops the door and it's in this chicken wire box essentially. We also use these commercially available traps and there's one that has a, a snowshoe hair in it. Here's a little sequence of a bobcat that's gonna be trapped. So it's, it's uh, we have a trail camera. We often would use trail cameras on the traps to help us understand how the cats were interacting with the traps. So there's a bobcat kind of investigating this trap. And sure enough, we, we ended up catching that cat. So when you catch an animal like that, then the next thing you, you need to do, if it's, if it's an animal that you want to process, you need to uh, anesthetize it. So we would give it a, 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 an immobilizing uh, drug for safe handling. And then we would do uh, various um, Measurements that we were interested in related to size and morphology, we would take a, a DNA sample because we're also doing genetic studies, which I'll talk a little bit about. We're interested in the different sort of sizes of the animals, body size and those kinds of things. So these are all fairly standard wildlife management types of um, uh, measures. We would you look at the, the tooth wear to help age the animal. Uh, Here's a good shot of the naked foot pad of a bobcat. So you can see there's no fur on that foot pad. And so you can imagine that that's disadvantageous for walking in deep snow. And that is also not a very big foot. This is interesting because this animal has this kind of color morphology on its feet. I just added the picture because it's kind of an interesting one. Okay. so. Once we are finished handling the animal, then we put it back into the trap for a safe recovery from the anesthetic. So there's Samantha with a cat going back in the trap. And I have now a sequence of uh, three or four, I think four videos that are just, they're all very brief videos, just like 30 seconds or so of just the releases of the cats, essentially, uh, just to show you the, the behavior of these cats. And this first one is, um, is Samantha putting um, a cat back in the trap. So this is an animal that's still drugged and it's going into the trap just to recover from the anesthetic. And I didn't turn the sound on, but there's no sound really. So don't worry about the sound. 
That one is not playing for some reason. Let's try this one. No, these aren't going to work. So not a big deal. They're just like uh, cats leaving traps. So not that exciting. For some reason they're not playing. Okay, I want to show you now. Uh, this is a, a a GIF of two links that are side by side uh, with GPS telemetry data that we can download through a satellite essentially. And you can see the locations um, mapped here. And you can see how these two, these are two adult male links. They're really not interacting with one another except for right along the, the boundary between the two territories. So you can see how pretty highly territorial they are and how um, they respect the boundary between the two. Very little exploration into the other animal's boundary. There's one moment here where the red lynx dips over into the blue lynx's territory briefly, like there, but doesn't happen very often. Pretty interesting. So just to give you an example of how these uh, lynx and bobcat home ranges relate, this is just a little section of a, of a map where there are some of some lynx and some bobcat home ranges. The lynx home ranges, these are all adult male home ranges. The lynx home range was 77 kilometers squared. And the bobcat on average, these, these ones, was 111 kilometers squared. So bobcat home ranges are bigger. Um, and I think another point that's quite notable, which I'll come back to, is that we didn't ever have a situation there where lynx and bobcats were uh, interacting with one another that we could detect through the GPS telemetry. So they were completely allopatric. So they weren't overlapping at all. Here's a, a few pictures of this bobcat. We had a bobcat that we temporarily thought was dead. So you might have a dead animal um, it, when you're using GPS transmitters. So many of you will know that that if you're using VHF transmitters, you rely on a signal change in order to tell that it's gone into mortality mode and then you can go and check it. You get a doubling of the pulse rate. But with GPS telemetry, you're not necessarily um, you know, listening for that, that pulse rate in the same way. Instead, you're downloading data from a satellite, which is more convenient, but uh, it can be more difficult to tell if the animal's dead that way except that if it's not moving, you might automatically think that it's died or it's dropped the collar. So it becomes something you wanna investigate. So in this case, we had uh, this animal that wasn't moving for quite a while and it was a bobcat that otherwise was healthy. So it was mysterious to us, very close to um, I think Blind River in that general area. And uh, then, Right around that same time, I got these emails from uh, another person who works for the MNRF who sent me these pictures that, that uh, their father had taken, I think. And it was this bobcat that was living in a, in a dump that the MTO uses for roadkill animals on the side of the highway. And the bobcat was just parked there feeding on these, uh, these carcasses. So it was actually living large, which I always thought was pretty funny because we thought it was dead, but it was, it was actually doing great. So uh, to give a, a little bit of an uh, overview on the results that we found on the distribution uh, across this area, this is a map that shows the distribution across our survey, survey area of lynx and bobcats. So this basically goes from the Sioux all the way over to Sudbury, all, ac all across the, the essentially the North Shore of Huron, the Highway 17 corridor, and then in, inland from there. And all the blue triangles are are places where we saw only lynx, and all the red squares are places where we saw only bobcats, and there were no sites where we had both. So that's notable. There were a few sites where we didn't detect either, um, but no sites where we where we did, where we had both. So there was complete separation across this area, but uh, between lynx and bobcats, which is pretty notable. 
we had, uh, you know, the probability when we do some modeling about the, the environmental conditions that would predict lynx and the environmental conditions that would predict bobcat, you can see there's quite a strong negative relationship between them. So bobcats are using areas that have higher food diversity. They have shallower and, and denser snow and lower and less coniferous forest. So in, that, in other words, they're kind of tending to be in this um, kind of like anthropogenically impacted area along the Highway 17 corridor. There's some agriculture. There's a, a sort of a, a, a diversity of food resources. There's also the types of uh, animals that are often associated with agriculture, you know, like things like, like wild turkeys or uh, white-tailed deer are more common. So they were in that type of more agricultural landscape all the way along the Highway 17 corridor. Whereas uh, the lynx was farther north, more inland, in deeper snow, more associated with coniferous forest, kind of homogeneous coniferous forest, but most importantly, really targeting snowshoe hares. So they're the best predictor of the distribution of lynx was places where there were hares, essentially. Not surprisingly, because they're obligate predators of hares. So they really rely on, on hares. And, and I think, um, you know, as a conservation uh, measure, uh, it's important to think about um, how, how, you know, how important hares are for lynx. So we um, wanted to, through the course of this work, develop a better understanding of causal processes and also larger scale context for what we were seeing in Ontario. And one of the good ways to do that is by using genetic data. So I'm gonna present some genetic data here. And uh, we are able to get genetic data both through our own studies, field studies, but also by collecting uh, um, samples from various resources like uh, fur harvest. And, uh, and so that's what we've done. We can get samples from auction houses, for example. I first want to give you just a very brief little primer on what I'm going to show you. So we're using something called neutral genetic markers for these first couple of slides. And that is just a way, you can, an easy way to think about that is that it's a way to kind of keep track of movement around the landscape. And so if you can imagine a situation where you have two one population, I'm sorry, of blue animals here. This is just a schematic. You have these blue animals and they are bisected by a river. Suddenly they will not be able to cross the river in this hypothetical scenario. And they can begin to diverge because they don't cross the river. And so genetically, they're now not the same anymore. They've diverged a bit. So that's what we call genetic drift. And you can then maybe have one brave individual that somehow or lucky gets across the river. And then you see that this red guy is over with the blue guys and you can measure that genetically. And that's essentially what we're doing. We see that, we see that this red guy is actually dispersed away from his red uh, ancestors. And that's the kind of information that I'm gonna present just using this concept of, of genetic drift essentially. So we have uh, uh, published a paper in 2012 that looks at samples from all across Canada. And what's interesting about lynx is that they are, uh, they reach very high densities when they're at the top of the cycle and they can move a long way. So there's this density dependent dispersal that I mentioned. So they're traveling all, they get these pulses of dispersal that goes, it goes uh, all across the country. And because of that, they're very highly connected genetically across most of Canada. So our studies have shown that, that um, if you using a certain set of markers of neutral genetic markers, like in this A panel here, all of these animals are identical genetically using the set of markers. So an animal, you couldn't tell whether an animal from Alaska genetically was different than one from Manitoba. They're the same, but you can tell that the ones from Newfoundland are different. They're showing this black, these black bars. And that's not so surprising because Newfoundland is an island. Um, but otherwise, this is an indication that there's high movement across the continent and high gene flow. If you use even more markers and you really drill down and you use certain kinds of analyses that allow you to detect very subtle types of structure, you can see that there is a little bit of structure due to a climatic gradient uh, 
across the Rocky Mountains, which is shown here. This was published in a paper this year. So there's very subtle gene flow type of structure across the Rocky Mountains, but it's very subtle, as I mentioned. There's also a very subtle effect of the, of the St. Lawrence River. For example, um, across the sort of gas Bay Peninsula, neutral genetic markers will show you that there's slight differentiation between the gas Bay and, and Quebec. Likewise, I mentioned already Newfoundland is different. More recently, we've shown that Cape Breton is also different. So all these little sort of insular populations are differentiated because the oceans are a barrier. And so there's drift that leads to differentiation. You get some of these kind of grouping happening. And you can actually kind of go use some of this type of data to age these splits. And so we can see that Cape Breton uh, is the oldest group of all these, followed by Newfoundland. And that this St. Lawrence uh, continental split is actually quite recent, you know, and it's really a reflection of sort of contemporary um, drift. So that sort of just what sets the stage for um, understanding about adaptations and uh, how we can use genetics also to measure adaptations and what that means for lynx and bobcats. So, for example, you know, you have a difference that's caused by genetics likely between having hair on your feet and having a naked footpath between the, the bobcat and the lynx. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to understand how current selection pressures might influence these species given the rapid environmental change. And those influences would be, would be mediated through changes in the genome. So just to give you an example, there, there is a study that was published uh, by some folks from the Canadian Museum of Nature in 2013 that uses morphological data and, and shows that lynx on islands are smaller. So we already know from that stuff I just showed you that lynx on Cape Breton and Newfoundland are differentiated uh, because of drift, but they're also smaller. And so uh, is there a, maybe a genetic basis for that? Well, it turns out that it's quite likely, likely that there is. So we've used this functional gene. So now these are genes that actually code for function. They're not the neutral markers. So these are genes that are actually um, responsible for, for producing traits in, in animals. This gene is called the insulin growth factor one, which is a really a fancy sounding name for something that has to do with body size essentially. And, what, what's notable here is that there's this purple color in Cape Breton. And again, this purple color in Newfoundland, that's, this is an allele, an allele 135. So this purple allele that only shows up on these islands. So it's evidence in this case that there's an allele, there's selection for small body size on these islands. And that that's, uh, that's underlain by this functional change in, in the genes. That's just an example to show you how functional genetics can be used. Now I want to go back to the Ontario um, context and, the, and our research on, on things, shifting distributions in Ontario. Um, and we, we have been interested in looking at something called a clock gene. There's a few different types of clock genes, but the ones that we're interested in looking at are called clock genes because they entrain the circadian rhythm. So they have a, they have a, a function in, um, uh, helping to essentially produce the proteins that lead to the circadian rhythm in the body. And what I'm showing you on this figure here is uh, on, the, on the, the main panel here, all this green, these are all the alleles for this gene. This is a gene called NR1D1, doesn't matter what it stands for, but these are all the lynx alleles. And the gray are all the bobcat alleles, the black and the gray and the white. So the important point here is that the bobcat alleles and the lynx alleles are completely separate. The bobcat alleles are smaller in size. And so you can totally tell a lynx from a bob bobcat because they have different genes for circadian rhythm and trainment. And that makes sense because bobcats are farther south. So they have, they're exposed to different uh, photo period, different temperature conditions and that sort of thing. So it's not at all surprising that this difference exists. Uh, relatedly, 
uh, in the 2000s, the, the aughts, I guess we're calling that maybe now, um, there was a, a group of researchers from the States who discovered hybrid, uh, a few cases of hybrid lynx and bobcats. For the first time, it was not known that they would hybridize. The hybrid animals have this kind of interesting tail pattern where there's a kind of a stripy banding. So it's not totally black and it's not totally white. So this is kind of, uh, at the time, was considered to be pretty distinct uh, uh, for indicating a, a hybrid animal. We have taken the work that, that that group did and expanded it because we have all these samples that we've collected from auction houses. And so we've looked across the whole continent for hybrids using neutral genetic markers. The way you normally identify hybrids is you compare the neutral genetic markers of one species and, uh, and the other species. And if you have animals that have half of their neutral markers from one type of species and half from the other, they're 50% each, that's a hybrid because you know they have one parent of each. Pretty easy genetically to tell that. And so when we do that across the whole continent, we find very small, very small number of hybrids, less than 1% of the animals that we looked at are hybrids. So there's using the neutral markers, there, there's not strong evidence for hybridization being very important. But then we went ahead and did the same type of analysis with the functional genetic markers. In particular, uh, we were interested in the clock gene that I just described to you. And so when we, when we look at the clock gene, you might remember that all the bobcats have one sort of size range of clock genes and the lynx have a different size range. And it's quite clear. But when we, when we look at um, those in the context of introgression, uh, and we're comparing the lynx animals that are known to be lynx and then matching it up with their clock chain across the whole continent. What we can find actually is that there are a bunch of lynx, all these asterisks in this little inset panel that have bobcat clock, clock chains. So that's evidence of introgression. So what that means, what is introgression? That is when you have a hybrid that breeds with a parental of one of the other species. So in other words, you have a lynx bobcat hybrid and that hybrid ends up uh, mating with a parent species. So it would mate in this case with a, with a lynx. And then that lynx could end up having offspring that has a bobcat clock gene. And that's how that happens. You get introgression of, that's how you get genes from one species skipping over into the other species. And if these bobcat clock genes are becoming selected for, then you end up having, you know, a potentially quite a, a large impact rapidly on the lynx genome because you would en end up having this sort of bobcat allele in there, which might pro provide them an opportunity to deal better with rapid environmental change. If it's selected for, it might lead to reduced fitness. There are a lot of possible outcomes that we don't know, but it's super interesting that we've started to see that. So people are, are calling these hybrids lynx. And I've also heard lobcat, and I'm not sure, I think blinks is a little better, but uh, uh, that is, if you hear someone talking about a blinks, you'll know what they're referring to. So uh, this, what I'm showing you here is from the IUCN, and this is their bobcat range map. So on the IUCN red list, you can, you can download the range maps that they provide there, and this is what they show for the bobcat. It's not particularly accurate, and I'll, I'll show more evidence of that in a moment, but, but we were interested in trying to understand, okay, it seems like we likely have more bobcats along Highway 17 than we, than we used to, you know, and so where are they coming from? And so we had a few different alternatives. If bobcats are coming into Ontario, how are they getting here? Well, you know, they might come around the west side of Lake Superior, they might come across the Upper Peninsula, we thought, of, of Michigan, but they could come across the uh, 80 Way corridor. There is this idea in, in the ISCN and also in the literature that there's this corn desert or the Rust Belt where there's no bobcats here south of the Great Lakes. And that's probably even true up to a point because, you know, otherwise we might have had bobcats along the North Shore of Lake Erie years ago. Um, but as we learned, there are actually more bobcats in this area than, 
or maybe that's a recent development, but there are, it's certainly not a big void like that map shows. This is the mean bobcat harvest uh, in recent years in Ontario. Certainly most of the bobcat harvest is hap happening on the North shore of Lake Huron. So that suggests that that's a, that's a hot spot for bobcats. We collected genetic samples of bobcats all around the Great Lakes Basin. And when you look at the genetic samples, you see there's this sort of a gradient, these three colors we've mapped on here. There's the red ones, the blue ones, and these sort of whitish ones in the middle. And it's these whitish ones that are coming into Ontario mostly. And as it turns out, they're coming in from the lower peninsula of Michigan, which we were surprised about. We expected them to be coming from the upper peninsula, but they're, they're uh, crossing the, the Mackinac Strait there and coming up onto St. Joe's Island, and then, you know, places like uh, along the Highway 17 corridor. Uh, it seems that the reason that the Upper Peninsula is not so good is because it's got quite deep snow. We built, uh, based on the genetic data, a uh, resistance map. So this map, on this map, the green areas show the places where we would expect there to be potential for a lot of bobcat gene flow. Uh, we, I think, uh, you can sort of ignore the top of the map there because we weren't really modeling up that area. It's mostly just around the Great Lakes. And you can see there's a lot of green going from the lower peninsula up across uh, St. Joe's up onto the, the North Shore. This is the map of, uh, or I'm sorry, the, a figure showing the change in bobcat harvest over time from the 80s up into today. So there's been, the numbers are still not that high but it's increased a lot. It's several fold bigger than it was. So the long-term trend suggests an increase in bobcats. We would, I think, expect that uh, conditions would, would lead bobcats to spread across uh, the North Shore and then down along the lake, uh, the, the Georgian Bay shoreline into central Ontario through that path down towards Midhurst and, and places like that, perhaps towards Peterborough. There's some evidence of bobcats crossing at the AWA and coming up the east side, but I think by far the, 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 the population from the North Shore is, is the largest population and will end up spreading eastward and southward into this part of Ontario. And we'll see more of, of these kinds of reports to the, to the point where they're no longer notable. I mean, it's interesting now, it's an interesting time. There are lots of bobcat sightings like these ones and you, it's, it's not rare to see them in the paper, but they're still rare enough that it's newsworthy and people are reporting them. And it's a novel animal in the landscape for a lot of people, even though hundreds of years ago, bobcats actually were not uncommon in Ontario. So they've, they've kind of gone through a, a time when they, they became rare uh, and then they're becoming more abundant again. On the other hand, lynx is a cold adapted northern species. And so uh, uh, it requires cold weather, you know, and so it's a species that we need to keep some cold weather around for that animal. Looking at the mean harvest uh, from 1980 to 2010, I showed that figure earlier. If you look at, the, so the sampling units there were, were these landscape units. And if you look at the, the mean temperature of the coldest quarter during those periods, this real sweet spot for lynx requires a kind of cold minus 17 to minus 12 kind of uh, band. You know, that's the real sweet spot for lynx. So if it gets too warm, you're not going to see lynx. And so um, just to wrap it up, you know, uh, this, uh, this is the Algoma landscape that I showed you initially. And this is a kind of a archetypal northern landscape. And I think it's the sort of thing that requires cold conditions to, to maintain it. And so I think with continued warming, we're gonna see you know, continued ecosystem changes in places like that. So currently we have bobcats running through this landscape, whereas you know, historically it would have been lynx. And so the, you know, the long-term consequences are hard to predict because there are a lot of difficult to anticipate potential you know, ecosystem level changes that, that happen when you, when you see sort of cascading effects that are possible.
And with that, I'd just like to really um, thank you again and also to acknowledge several collaborators on this work who were instrumental and, and played key roles. Paul Wilson is one, Dr. Paul Wilson at Trent. Dennis Murray at Trent is another collaborator. Dr. Erin Cohn, who did her PhD on this work, uh, is another. Dr. Melanie Prentice also did her PhD on this work. Uh, Kristen Watt, Jeff Rowe, Aaron Walpole, Erica Newton, Dr. Robbie Murat, and Samantha Moran. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you have. I'm gonna stop the share so that we can have the, the uh, gallery view.